Hi, everybody. Hello. Welcome to our History Talks. Um, tonight we have Mr. Steve Willard and Richard Carlson from the San Diego Police Museum, and they will be telling us about the people and characters that populated the scenery and the people that were in charge of patrolling it. So take it away, guys. Okay, well, we really appreciate you guys coming out for us here. I, I'm the president of the Police Historic Association, and uh, we actually have a, a museum. A lot of people don't realize that. We have a museum at 4710 College Avenue, and that museum is uh, it's a 4,000 square foot museum, so you're all welcome to come up there and check it out on occasion. And we have a lot of community involvement there. We even provide the community with a, uh, a community meeting area that they could come in and do things. And we just love to be involved with the public. Um, even though I'm the president of the Historic Association, Steve is the vice president. And he's probably the most knowledgeable person that I know about the history of the police department. I know a lot about it, but he knows a lot more about it. He put a PowerPoint together for you today. And so I'm going to let Steve take it from there. And I think you'll enjoy some of the things we have to say. Thank you very much. Um, for those of you, I'm going to back this up just one slide here. Does anybody recognize that building right there in the center of that badge? That's the old police headquarters, and that is our largest historical artifact. And that's the reason that the police museum exists today. We were formed in 1996 with two missions. One, to save the old police headquarters from demolition, and the other was to establish a police museum. Now, we thought that would be pretty easy. We'll save the building, we'll get a museum in there. We do not have a museum in there. However, we were, to date, I think we're the only organization in the history of mankind to actually get the San Diego Unified Port District to do a U-turn. So, um, anyway, so much to their credit, they did do a great restoration on it. The building is on the National Register of Historic Places. It's one of only 25 police facilities in the United States to achieve that status as a national landmark. And the really neat thing about it, it's only one of two in the state of California police facilities to be on the National Register and it's the only police headquarters in California. The other location is the LA Police Museum, which is located on Eagle Rock, uh, on York Boulevard in uh, Los Angeles, their old Northeastern Police Station. That is a headquarters. Station means one of many. Headquarters means the mothership, the hub. So, uh, so that's something we're very proud of. So that's why it's on the centerpiece for our badge. And like Rick was saying, um, Rick came on the police part in 1969, or maybe 1869. I give him a bad time about that. <laughs> and by the way, like it's, it's okay, okay to laugh at these stupid jokes. If these are good jokes, you'd have paid a lot more money to be here. <laughs> but Rick was really a mentor of mine for a while. And there's actually a funny story about how we even met. I was moving some furniture one time, and he had a truck. So I go, hey, Rick, can you help me move some furniture? And he didn't realize there's a whole house full of furniture in a Ford Ranger pickup truck. We looked like an episode of Sanford and Son. But it worked out really well. We wound up getting together. And quite frankly, we couldn't have saved the police headquarters without him having my back and me having his and a few other people. Uh, Von Marie May, for those of you who may know her, also gets a tremendous amount of props because she really kept us honest. And we were just kind of bulldogged and uh, got the job done. But since that time, we've expanded to where we're at now, 4710 College Avenue in an old city library. Ideally, we'd like to be in the old police headquarters. Never say never. We may ultimately be there, but that's where we're at for now. Um, a little bit about myself you see on the screen there. I still actually work with SDPD. I've been there since 1985, so quite a long time. I remember when you could drive around down here and there were for sale signs on every corner and warehouses were $100,000. If only I had some <laughs> foresight, I would be up here telling you how to make millions. Um, but like Rick was saying, um, I've written four books on the history of San Diego Police Department and my latest one is called San Diego Murder and Mayhem and it includes a chapter did you, did you buy that book? Well, you just doubled my sales. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> my mom's good for one copy. <laughs> but um, the, in there is, a article, is a chapter called Murder in Chinatown. And it covers a lot of this area, including 428 uh, 4th Avenue, where there was a murder. Unfortunately, the building's not there anymore. But we'll cover that in a little bit because there's something that kind of incredible happened that today nobody would even look twice at. But the police department did something pretty extraordinary back in 1920. So moving along, and by the way, this is an interactive. If anybody's got questions, comments, jump right in. If you have rotten fruits and vegetables to throw, please hold that until the end. But um, this is a museum, like Rick was talking about, 4710 College. Ideally, it's not the best location, but it's better than nothing. Um, we have also in our fleet 21 historical police cars. 
one of every decade. We have the largest fleet of historical police cars in the United States, and for that matter, probably the world. If you go on our website, sdpolicemuseum.com, you can see those. There's 2,300 pages on that website. So there's a lot to learn about the history of the San Diego Police Department. The overwhelming majority of those pages are biographical pages. Um, over on the left-hand side of the main screen, you'll see it says reflections. You can click on there, and decade by decade, you can go through and you can pick out an officer's name, click there, and their obituary will come up, and in many cases, associate news articles as well. Um, the history of the police department really is tied to the history of the city, because whether you like cops or you don't like cops, the truth is you really can't exist without them. So in some cases, we're like car insurance. You don't really like paying for it, but it's nice to have around when you need one. But the truth of the matter is, is that San Diego has not always been America's finest city. And a little bit later on, you'll hear exactly how bad it was. But to kind of jump real quick, I want to go through a little bit of an evolution here. Because obviously, San Diego has not always been in the state of California. The state of California hasn't always been in the United States of America. Now, what this doesn't show you here, because we had the town of Caldi under the Mexican rule, but prior to that, the Spanish were here from 1769, but for 10,000 years prior to that, you had Native Americans who enforced their own laws. And usually the way they did it was a family would convene and figure out, okay, what do we think is appropriate punishment if somebody did something to a member of the tribe or something like that. Um, when Spanish explorers landed at Ballast Point in 1542, they put their foot on the ground and they got arrows shot at them. So they also enforced no trespassing rules back then as well. Yeah. But um, after we became an American city in 1850, uh, we had a city marshal. His name was Agustin Harzasi. Uh, there's not a spelling test later on this. But here's a couple interesting things. By a show of hands, anybody here enjoy Zinfandel wine? <laughs> Everybody know the story about how he's connected to that? Agustin Harzasi was the first city marshal of San Diego. He's also the first sheriff but he's also a Hungarian count. And he was one of the richest immigrants to the United States when he came here in the 1840s. He's a friend of President James Polk. But he came to the United States and he started migrating from the east to the west. He said, I'm gonna establish a wine country. I want to grow my grapes, I want to create wine. So we actually called him the winemaker. And um, after he left San Diego in 1852, he went north, became the first to sayer the San Francisco Mint. In 1855, in 1857, he bought a whole patch of land up in Sonoma and opened the Buena Vista Winery. He was the founder of the California wine industry. Zinfandel is his creation. If you go to the Buena Vista Winery today, and this is not a plug for them, and in fact, I don't even drink wine, but um, if you go there, you'll see billboards there where the count is back. They're resurrecting a lot of his recipes and they're, brewing, they're making wine. I don't think you brew it, but they're fermenting wine the way he would have 100 and some odd years ago, 168 years ago. So that part's pretty cool, but interesting guy. Because when the city of San Diego started in 1850, we had $10,000 in our treasury. San Diego didn't have a lot of people, but $10,000 really was a lot of money. But Agustin Harzasi has the city marshals paid a salary of $1,000. Now, if you mathematicians, do your percentage here. 10% of the city budget went to one guy. So he went to the city council, and not by coincidence, his uh, father-in-law and his dad were on the, one of them was the city attorney. The other was on the city council and said, we need a jail. Now, what do we do with people prior to that? We gave them two choices, leave town or get shot. So they kept crime down, but we said, we're gonna be a little more civilized, we're gonna build a jail. So they took some bids, and Agus and Harsey submitted a bid to build a jail for $5,000 out of 10, plus his $1,000 salary. Uh, the Israel brothers, Robert Israel, I remember, recognize that name if you go to the Point Level Lighthouse, him and his brother submitted a bid of $3,000. Agus and Harsey got the bid because he said, we want a quality job, not a discount job. So he built a jail out of mud, brick, and straw in Old Town, and the first time it rained, it melted. So he went back to the city council and said, I need $2,000 more to rebuild the jail. So they gave him $2,000 more. Now, we're at 80%. Um, he rebuilds the jail, and the first guy he arrested was a young guy named Flanty Bean. He's a 25-year-old guy for dueling. He booked him into the jail. Flanty spent about 24 hours there, used a spoon to dig his way through the walls and took off. Went to Los Angeles and became a Los Angeles Ranger. <coughs> he later went by his middle name of Roy Bean when he established a saloon in Texas and became Judge Roy Bean Law west of the Pecos. Now, what did that do to the city? Well, guess what? The city went bankrupt because after that, we had a war with the Native Americans lived down in Mission Valley, and it was a mess. But one of the most remarkable things that Agassiz Harsey did for all the stumbling he might have done, and this guy was kind of a modern Indiana Jones. He, believe it or not, he died in 1869 in Nicaragua trying to cross the river and was eaten by an alligator. So who goes out like that? But um, he hired a deputy city marshal in 1850 by the name of Richard Freeman. Or perhaps his name is pronounced Richard Freeman. 
which was remarkable. He was a former slave 13 years before the Emancipation Proclamation. Richard Freeman was probably, as best we can tell, the first black lawman in California and probably west of the Mississippi, 13 years before the Emancipation. That's an amazing uh, bragging right for the city of San Diego. Unfortunately, Richard Freeman was killed in 1851 in that war I was talking about with the Indians. But uh, we did memorialize him at our museum, and his story is online at SD Police Museum as well. So we kind of bounced around from city marshals. If you notice, these dates start and end. Well, that was due to the bankruptcy, and then they reinstated them in 1862 to 1879. And then there's a gap from 1879 to 1885. We had no law enforcement in the city. So it kind of ebbed and tied, and I'll show you a little bit later why that happened. But before we go too much into that, I want to talk about specifically Chinese and how Chinese relate to the city of San Diego, the history behind them. But to get to that, I want to jump into, first of all, when they came to California. Why did most people come to California in 1849, 1850? It was gold. Yeah, there was gold in them their hills. And a lot of people came. Some people made money. Most of them didn't. Um, the Chinese immigrants were no different. They wanted to make a living for their family as well. Unfortunately, they didn't have the same experience like that. Not all of them were welcome, and they even had laws that were starting to pass. Now, to understand what California, and for that matter, the United States was like, is not like today. It's equal rights are something we just consider sacrosanct today. It wasn't always like that. At one time, in the state of California, it was against the law for a Native American to testify against a, I'm sorry, for a Caucasian, Native American to testify against a Caucasian in a court of law. That was kind of a big deal when we appointed Edward Bushyhead as the chief of police in 1899 a Native American as chief of police at a time in California where he could not testify against a uh, Caucasian in a court of law. Ned Bushyhead was actually the sheriff of San Diego County. And if you've ever been into Old Town, to the Old Town San Diego Union Museum, you'll see in 1868 when they started, him and Jeff Gatewood were the founders of the San Diego Union newspaper. Now, why isn't his name a lot bigger then? Because at the time, Bushy had said, you know, I don't know that we're going to sell newspapers if the Indian's name is on the papers. So they grabbed a guy who ran the printing press named Bersano, and they put his name there. But the truth of the matter is, is a Native American played a huge part in establishing San Diego's newspaper. And he was a lawman. He was a sheriff. He was a San Diego police commissioner. In fact, we had a board of police commissions. So he's kind of a big deal for somebody like that. And again, diversity in a time period where it just was something that was completely foreign to a lot of people. The other thing about San Diego is how it changed so much. This is San Diego in 1876, and you can see across the bay, North Island was pretty much nothing. Um, believe it or not, North Island and Coronado used to be part of the city of San Diego. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, I have a big mouth. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, North Island and Coronado used to be part of the city of San Diego up until 1890. And uh, we allowed them to secede from the city and form their own municipality, which if you look at tax revenue, I don't know that that was the best decision ever made, <laughs> but it is what it is. But as you can see, everything was concentrated either down here, which is called Newtown, or back up in Old Town, and there wasn't a lot in between. How did we get around? Well, horse and buggy, horses are just playing feet of walking. But San Diego's really spread out at that point. So when the police started patrolling this, there were literally huge swatches of land that went unpatrolled. Now, as mentioning Agustin Harzlesey being the county sheriff in 1850, the borders of San Diego County were not like they are today. They went from the ocean all the way to the Arizona line, from Mexico all the way up into parts of San Bernardino County, and literally up along where the 760 area code covers almost into Northern California. And then it came down to Los Angeles County was there, but San Diego County encompassed Orange County, Riverside County. It was huge, and we only had about 1,500 people living here that were considered people. You know, there are a lot of Native Americans. We just let them enforce their own laws, of course. But um, again, this is a different world. And the reason I keep emphasizing that is because we're gonna get into some stuff that was remarkably repugnant for what happened then. And today we wouldn't allow it. Unfortunately, it was a normal course of business back then. And that's getting into the 1870s when we started having anti-Chinese riots across California. Um, when times are good, and we still do this today, when times are good, hey, everybody's welcome, come on in, let's all enjoy the wealth. When things start to get ugly, start to fall apart, or gold starts to run out in the hills, things start to change, or people start to blame each other. Well, who's to blame? That guy, he's different. He's not from our tribe, he's from, you know, so we've seen it lots of times in history. It happened in the 1870s. It started up in Northern California, and we had a number of Chinese who were killed. I mean, this is an uh, actual drawing of what a riot would have looked like. This is, I believe, up in San Francisco, though where it was probably the worst. In San Francisco, for 
all the stuff that they have going on, they've pretty much always been a very large city for about the last 150 years. They've been just jammed on that little peninsula, 40,000, 50,000, 60,000 people, all the way up to more than half a million at a time when we had literally five or 10,000 people. So it's interesting today because if you were to ask most people by a show of hands, which city is bigger, the city of San Diego population wise or the city of San Francisco? Who says San Francisco is larger than us population wise? We're twice the size of San Francisco population wise. But they are 42 square miles on that peninsula. The San Diego Police Department's Eastern Division is 47 square miles. San Francisco has 2,100 cops, Eastern Division has 80. So, but they have a little bit, few more people. But, anyways, I digress. Anyway, so unfortunately, San Diego was not able to stay away from those riots, and they migrated here down in the summer of 1877. And that really caused a problem because there were mobs in the streets, which are bad enough, but also people are starting fires. And in the 1870s, San Diego was mainly wood. And we knew we did not have an abundance of water, and if fires got out of control, we're going to have a big problem, as in no more city. So the man tasked with restoring that type of order at this time was Sheriff Joseph Coyne. Now, Joseph Coyne actually um, has a pretty distinguished police career with the San Diego Police Department as well. But in 1877, he was the one who was going to be tasked with putting an end to uh, the rioting and looting. And he did what most sheriffs did in that day. Let's round up some vigilantes, get some guns, and let's put an end to this nonsense. But the good news is he sent out 200 vigilantes into the street to put an end to this, and nobody got killed. Not a single person. That's pretty remarkable given where everybody else was. And we put it down pretty quick as well. So San Diego has had a reputation for a very long time of getting out in front of problems and not letting them metastasize into complete messes. For those of you who remember more recently, about 20 years ago, Seattle had the WTO and about brought the city of San, uh, Seattle to its knees. We had the same group of troublemakers show up about four months later and we did not have those problems. So again, we were out in front of it. Um, we've had political conventions. We have not had the rioting like Chicago and Miami and other places of experience as well. That's not luck. That's a police force that's out in front of this type of stuff and getting on top of it when we can. So we're gonna move now up until, um, any questions so far? I talk really fast sometimes. I hear snoring in the back though, so. Okay, <laughs> okay. so if you look at this timeline here, this is kind of interesting because from 1879 to 1885, we had some big changes. Now, I said in 1879, the city abolished law enforcement. Said, let's the sheriff handle it. We don't need any type of uh, police in this town. Because at that time, we only had 2,700 people. Look at the population in 1887. It went to 40,000. Why? Because of this. The railroad came. And then steamships started coming. And we actually started to grow up to be a very big city. Now, it's interesting because in 1888, housing prices, some of them were $1,000 for a house in San Diego. And we had 40,000 people. In 1894, we only had 6,000 people and a house was about 200 bucks. So we've had real estate booms and busts before. And same thing, it's just all cyclical. We've all gone through this before. Um, now, and here it says in 1885, to give you some idea of what San Diego was like in 1885, the New York Times wrote that San Diego was gang infested, was murderous, drug dealing, and I would, in, in the words of the editor, I would rather freeze to death in the cold than take a bullet in the chest in the balmy tropical climate of San Diego. <laughs> now that was actually an improvement because in 1853, after we went bankrupt, the New York Times described San Diego as the most god in, the most godforsaken, rat-infested flea hole on the planet. So <laughs> I guess we're moving up. <laughs> Still haven't got America's finest yet, but we're headed in the right direction. But in order to retake the city. And what this is that you're looking at here, this is one of the houses that were being used for opium dens, prostitution, and all kinds of other illicit activity down in this very area. The Stingery, the Gas Lamp, Chinatown, and Darktown were all really melded right into this very, about five blocks that way, and all the way to the water. And for those of you who think the water is down at the foot of the convention center, it hasn't always been like that. That is Phil. We have incrementally walled, uh, pieced off pieces of the bay as the city has actually grown in land size. And it's done that all along the waterfront where the port district now um, is controlled as the state tidelands. So what we did in 1885 was we said we need a police force. So Joseph Coyne was called out of uh, retirement as sheriff and he was appointed as the city marshal of San Diego. And a city marshal is different than police. Even though they wore the same uniforms, they wore a badge that said San Diego Police on there, they were not necessarily tasked with law enforcement first and foremost. Tax collection, dog catcher, building roads, building hospitals, things like that, also fell under their purview. There were 25 of them, and these guys did such a good job, this is what the San Diego Union said about them. 
What is with the San Diego police? Records of the city show there is such an organization, yet notwithstanding the fact the criminal element has been holding carnival during the last few days, the guardians of the peace have done nothing to indicate their own duty. So they're not doing quite a very good job. And it wasn't necessarily their fault entirely. It was being tasked with other things. And quite frankly, knowing that the city also did not have their back. Because anytime you have vice and illicit activity, and you have people with money and they have power, well, guess what? Everybody's got friends. We're starting to see this now with that school thing that's starting to break. But um, when we started talking about we're going to close this down, we got back, oh, no, you're not, because the uh, city's making some money on this. And the people holding office are making money, and they own brothels and drug dens and all this other stuff. Just keep it down there, and there's not going to be a lot of problem. Well, not necessarily the right thing to do. Uh, but the city marshals, by 1889, we go, we need to change, and we need to do something different. So they recognized Joseph Coyne was a good leader, but he needed to do something different. Now, you remember I showed you that picture? Let's take a look at that again. There's 25 of these guys here, all right? 25, all right? Now look what they give him to work with. 12. So they cut the city of San Diego's law enforcement bureau in half, but they also said law enforcement first and foremost, that's all you're going to do. Tax collection will be done by something else, a dog catcher, that's on its own, and so on and so forth. So Joseph Coyne was appointed, appointed our first chief of police. He was also our last city marshal. Now, one of the interesting things about our history, and we literally are learning as we go, for the longest time we struggled to figure out what is this badge that he is wearing. This badge was his badge. And for the longest time, using photogrammetry, we were able to figure out how big it was, but we really didn't know what it said in the center. We really didn't know what that center seal was, and we really struggled, what the heck are these here? So we made that, and we said, well, what if we're wrong? I said, well, that'd be a good problem to have, wouldn't it? Because then we'd figure out what it really looked like. Well, it turns out we were wrong. That is somewhat of a representation, but the thing in the center is not the state seal, it's a diamond. These are white diamonds as well. This is made of solid gold, white and gold. If you find that badge, please come talk to us. We will make you the deal of a lifetime. So he was the only man to ever wear it. Now what's interesting is, um, formed a 12-man San Diego Police Department because we only hired men back then. Uh, but look at this. His great-granddaughter was a San Diego Police Department detective, did a full career here, and she was hired in 1989, 100 years after her grandfather's chief of police. Um, so we have a female who does a full career on the PD. So I think Joe will probably be proud. He actually made a lot of money in mining interests in Julian. And then after he was here, he went up to San Francisco and ultimately died in 1916. Now, the first day of the San Diego Police Department was kind of interesting because those 12 officers started on June 1st, 1889. And they worked two shifts, 7 in the morning to 7 at night, or 7 at night to 7 in the morning. Super easy. Be like, well, what are their days off? You didn't have any. So he worked seven days a week. Everybody walked. So this thing about, oh, cops are all on horseback? No, only one was on horseback. And the officers paid $25 extra to do it. So it's good money, because look at this, $80 a month to start. We computed out what that meant. Now again, a house is hovering at right about 800 to 1,000, so not too shabby on the, the pay there. And um, also the uniforms had to be worn whenever they're in public, and a uniform cost $42.50. Now, you'll see pictures of officers wearing those long blue coats, and they almost look like London Bobbies with the helmets. And a lot of people say, were the cops unarmed? And the answer is no, they were not. We have never had unarmed cops, but they had to wear their guns under their tunics. So you can imagine, you know, you're walking down in this area, and you see a bad guy there. And this is a rough neighborhood down here, quite frankly. And you see a guy and says, hey, I want to arrest you. And the guy's, oh, yeah. And you go, whoa, hold the time out. I got to get my gun. So a lot of times, officers are known to walk down the street holding their gun at their side. And uh, it really was a tough town. And if you think about it, you look at a modern police officer today. The officer's walking, they have a radio, they have a cell phone, they have all this equipment, GPS, body camera. They only had a badge, a gun, handcuffs, and a lot of guts. And that's really all they had. And they survived on their wits. And if anything happened to them when they were out, you might not know for five, six, seven, ten hours. And I'm going to show you a picture in this next slide and tell you a pretty extraordinary story about a guy who... Uh, well, let's just say he had an interesting experience. But this is picture will give you an idea of why we hired, what we were looking for when we hired cops. Look at this. In 1900, the average American male stood 5'7 and weighed 145 pounds. In 1900, the average officer stood 6'2 and weighed 225. So these were big guys. Now, I know we have a Keno Wilson uh, reenactment uh, specialist here. I mentioned George Pringle. That's George Pringle on the far left. 
Any picture that Kino was in and George Pringle was in, they were always standing together. This picture was taken two years prior to Kino Wilson being hired. But this was the entire police force of 1897, not a lot of people. This area here was our main police headquarters and it was on 2nd Street, which is literally just one block up there where Horton Plaza is now. We've actually been in this area for quite a while as far as headquarters goes. Um, our first headquarters was in Old City Hall at Florent. We've never seen any documents that had a height requirement other than you have to be more than five foot nine. Um, but um, our idea, and I'll tell you how I know this, these guys were hired to be big and strong. And Pringle had mentioned, and the way we know this is uh, Pringle served from 1894 to 1936. So he did 42 years. Um, in 1935, a guy named Bob Carroll was hired and he worked for Pringle. And we started our museum, retired Lieutenant Bob Carroll was there to talk to us and he told us a lot about Pringle. And Pringle had mentioned, you know, you walk the waterfront since your fist. Guys would challenge you to fight. A lot of rough sailors down here, a lot of bars, you know, a lot of AWOL sailors. So um, by educated guests, most of these guys are hired just because they're big and strong. They did not have to, uh, you know, be like today where they're writing, you know, 15, 20 page police reports. Uh, Frank Northern, who is, uh, where is Frank? Right here was 43 years old, I mean, he was hired as a Civil War veteran. But the rest of them had really no military background per se. Um, Pringle was a house painter before he was hired to work here. So I'm not sure what the quantifier was. Um, we've never been able to find, and we do discover stuff all the time. Our history is uh, evolving. One of the more interesting things we found, it's on the police museum website under the virtual museum, is probably our first police report written. We were voted as a department on May 9th, 1889. This is dated May 10th. And it just literally is one sheet of paper on the city letterhead that said Joe Wilson had his ox cart stolen. Boom, there you go. So <laughs> I wish we could do that today. <laughs> so, um, but you know, like I said, big, strong, brave, and probably willing to put up with more than your average person was about probably the hiring requirements. And now Frank Northern um, also wrote down a lot in his memoirs. And Frank Northern served as first under the pre San Diego Police and the city marshals San Diego Police era of 1887. He actually left the department in 1889, so he was not one of the first original 12, but he came back in November and then served until 1911. And he was the first officer to retire from the police department. But that was not without controversy because the city said, wait a minute, you were gonna pay you money, go sit at home? No, you're fired for dereliction of duty. Because they found out that Frank would get up and he'd take a walk around the block to stretch his legs on graveyard shift. He had somebody there to take over that is the desk sergeant, but that wasn't good enough. Anyways, Frank appealed his case to the public and uh, enough public outrage was generated so the city paid him a pension. Now, he was 66 years old at the time, in 1911. If they were hoping he'd go away, well, they were sorely mistaken. He actually lived until 1941 and died at the age of 96. So he got a 30-year pension out of that. So Frank did pretty well for himself. But one of the things that happened to Frank was Frank was on foot patrol down on Fifth Avenue and there was a warehouse and we had a gang of safe burglars down here called the Backbreakers. And Frank was on patrol and he hears a ruckus going on. He's like, I better go investigate. And he goes in there and he's completely out. Remember these guys, these guys swarm him and they literally beat him down and they throw him in a basement and he's all bound and gagged. And he, during the fight, he actually got stabbed a couple of times. So he's bleeding. So he's, he's laying down there and like most basements, you know, you have the windows up above. He could tell he was somewhere on fifth, but he didn't know exactly where. So he saw a barrel across the basement. He kind of shimmied over there and was able to cut his bindings. And he's coming up the stairs. The bad guys are coming down and the fight was back on. And this time they clubbed him really good and they knocked him unconscious. When he woke up again, he was inside of a box and he could hear them nailing the lid down onto the box. And he's like, uh-oh. So he's thinking that they're gonna throw him into the bay as they put him onto the back of a horse buggy, but he can feel the bumpy road and it's too far to the bay. So he realizes he's not going to the bay. So ultimately they took him out to Mission Valley and they dumped the box off the back of the wagon and they started digging a grave. They're gonna bury him alive. Well, a couple of cowboys up on the hill are watching this whole thing and they're going, this, there's something wrong about this. And they wind up riding down and they get in a bit of a shootout with these uh, roughnecks uh, and they take off and they pull Frank out of the box and he grabs a horse and comes screaming back into town. He ultimately caught two of the gang and they went to prison, but um, had he not had the citizenry looking out for him, uh, Frank would have been reported missing in action. I don't think we ever would have figured out what happened to him. So all these guys had some very interesting stories about how law enforcement was done back then. But as you notice here, this looks like an all white male police force. Not necessarily, this is Jose Cota. And Jose Cota was hired in 1889, and as his name would sound, he was Hispanic. He was also our first sergeant. 
So he was the first minority to hold rank within the police department. And uh, he actually ser served until 1902 and ultimately had a brain disease that cost him his life. But um, outstanding uh, citizenry, and some of his family is still around as recently as the 1970s. Remember Albert Coda? He used yep. to work there? That was his, one of his grandchildren. Was so. it mustache or requirement? <laughs> you know, that's a, that's a good question. I think it was. I think it made you just look a little bit more macho. So, um, now, I know we have a Keno Wilson reenactor in here, and this is where Keno's going to get a ton of props. In 1900, again, you saw what the police department was, all white male police force. Keno, has everyone heard the name Keno Wilson? Oh, yeah. Keno Wilson, if you were to rate all of the police chiefs, and with all due respect to my boss now, Keno Wilson was probably the best police chief we ever had. And the way you kind of judge a police chief is almost like a president. You can't really, despite any opinion you might have, good, bad, or indifferent, at a president or a chief, you can't really judge a legacy until they're gone a few years. And you see what it is they did. Because at the time, you're so far into it, it might not make a ton of sense. And let me tell you, Keno did some stuff that really upset the apple cart. Um, as you notice, in 1917, he appointed a female police officer. Now, what in 1917 were women not allowed to do? Vote. Yeah, they're not allowed to vote. This is extraordinary. He appointed two female police officers. Lucy was a bit of a mystery to us. And um, one day, Rick and I were talking to the executive director of the La Jolla Historical Society. And I happened to mention Lucy's name. And he goes, Lucy, that's our policewoman. Really? Because we can't find document. Oh, we got everything. Want her picture? Oh, yeah. So her badge is actually in the museum, by the way. This is Lucy. Lucy is five foot nine and weighed 175 pounds. She's a force to be reckoned with. Uh, the reason Lucy was hired was apparently there were some scandalous women down at the beaches wearing bathing suits that showed their ankles. That was a big deal. And they were concerned that a bunch of sailors, whoa, you know, um, would just, there you would know, be all kinds of trouble. So they wanted Lucy to enforce the dress code. Um, she worked out of her house on Coast Boulevard. For those of you familiar with that area over there, there's a hotel there called the Pantai Inn right now. The owner of the Pantai Inn is a lady named Larnie Duros. And Larnie got a hold of me one day and she said, hey, do you know the name Lucy Girdo? And I said, yeah. She goes, oh, well, I don't know if this means anything to you, but her house is on our property. Really? So yeah, so her house is still there. It's been restored. And if you want to spend, I think, $350 a night, you can actually stay in Lucy's old house. $350 is probably how much the house cost at the time. But Lucy did an extraordinarily good job. She was out making arrests. And this, again, this is kind of a big deal. We had had women in the ranks since as early as 1910. Now, the Los Angeles Police Department will tell you, Alice Stebbin Wills is the world's first policewoman. That's not true. Chicago PD had a female detective sergeant in the 1880s. However, on the West Coast, it certainly was. And it was certainly the first person to have the title of policewoman. However, we had women matrons and we had this inside matrons and we had outside matrons. Inside matrons worked in the jail and they tended to female prisoners, juveniles, things like that. Outside matrons actually did dance hall inspections, bars, other things like that. So they were doing what a policewoman would have been doing as far back as 1910 as well. However, the name was a little bit different. So again, this is remarkable given the time period. Today, nobody looks twice at a female cop. We had a female police chief as our last police chief. Hey, nobody blinked at it because we're, we're equal now. We've can, reached I can tell one little yeah. policewoman story. We had a policewoman down here that she was out in the field walking around. The women wore a white blouse and a white skirt. And the reason they did was that skirt and blouse cost 50 cents. The men's uniform cost about $5 or something like that. So it was, that's why she didn't get it. But she was at a bar right very close to where we are here. And they said uh, the chief, well, I guess, was Moriarty and He's Peter an Wilson. Yeah. They were cruising in the in the Dodge machine, they called it. And as they drove by, they saw her go into a bar. Well, she could go into a bar if she was going there on a call. But other than that, women weren't allowed to go in the bar. It was illegal. What she was doing was going in the bar to buy some cigars for a guy that worked down the, downtown. And so they questioned her about it, and she got angry and threw her badge down because they were going to send her back to the jail. And uh, then they had a, a hearing, and we have the actual documentation of the hearing of, of everything. And it's very similar to what takes place now, but they upheld her firing because of the fact that she took her badge off and threw it down and said that, I, you know, I'm done with this because I'm not going back there. <laughs> so they upheld uh, the firing of her at that particular point. So that's why I objected. Yeah. Cool. 
And you know, you're gonna see a, you're gonna see something here that even though SDPD was pretty diverse and out there, the deck was still stacked against people of color, of females, and things like that. We gave them an opportunity, but the truth be told, in that era, they had to work five times as hard for the same amount of respect. So hopefully, at the end of this. There is some respect for people like Lucy, but also for Frank McCarter here. And if you notice, Frank McCarter was black in 1909. And if you think about this, and this is kind of cool, everybody knows who Jackie Robinson was, right? 1947, he steps to the plate and becomes the first black player in Major League Baseball. Jackie Robinson was born in 1918. Frank McCarter was a cop in 1909. So that's pretty remarkable. And then you go back 59 years prior to that for Richard Freeman patrolling the streets as well. So we've been out in front of this. Now, just because we were diverse, it doesn't mean the city accepted him. Does anybody remember about two or three years ago, there was a lawsuit filed over a cartoon of Frank McCarter? If you go onto the SD Police Museum website, in 1934, Frank McCarter died. Look at his page. There is a cartoon that is the most disgusting, repugnant, awful, racist cartoon I've ever seen in my life. It depicts Frank McCarter as a gorilla in a police uniform on patrol down in Darktown and Chinatown. And the guy who did the cartoon was such a talented bigot, he actually managed to insult the Chinese as well. Because in there, he has, it says, the bell rings when Cop McCarter comes walking through the neighborhood. He's got his gun stuffed in his back pocket. Again, he looks like a gorilla. And the dog even has A's and features. And it says, even the chink's dog beats him to safety. And it's got the him much bad. It was horrible. So we found this cartoon in 1997 in our museum. We said, what do we do with this? And this is one of the things you struggle with as a museum. Because as much as a Holocaust museum exists to portray the Holocaust, you're not going to go burn Nazi banners. They need to be preserved, even though it is ugly history. So we really struggled with this. And Rick and I had some long conversations about, does this cartoon ever see the light of day? And we decided, you know what, let's go to the San Diego Black Police Officers Association and see what we need to do. And they took a look at it and they said, absolutely, this absolutely needs to be displayed because this shows how ugly and nasty this world was and we would never accept that today. But it paints a picture that if that cartoon could appear in the San Diego Sun newspaper. It was on the front page of the paper. How brave was this guy to go to work the next day? Because guess what? The city did not have his back. So when a certain individual, I don't know that he entirely understood the context of the cartoon, but was shown the cartoon, he filed a lawsuit against the city of San Diego and the police museum as well. So at the deposition, his attorney asked me, held up a cartoon, goes, do you see how a black man could find this offensive? I said, sir, every human being should find that offensive. That is the most disgusting, repugnant thing I've ever seen. However, it shows that this man was a hero. He saw that in the newspaper and still chose to go to work knowing if I get shot, stabbed, or attacked, there's not gonna be 12 people that's gonna have my back. There's not gonna be 12 people that say, yeah, this is wrong, you know, the guy attacked a policeman. They would have said, yeah, good riddance. So these officers, these minority officers, the female officers, you know, patrolling when they don't have a right to vote are a lot bigger heroes than I think a lot of people who live in this world right now can fully comprehend and appreciate. So that's one of the big deals with us in diversity. And a lot of people say, hey, what about this? You got to take the historical perspective of the time. Ned Bushy had again, Cherokee Indian. But over here is Officer Thomas Aquin and his Chinese American officer in 1917. Again, this was not an equal thing. In our SD Police Museum, we do have a page for black officers honoring them for service in pre-1964. What was the big deal about 1964? The Civil Rights Act of the United States. Has anybody seen the movie Green Book? Yeah. Did anybody know what the Green Book was? I, I have not seen the movie. I don't know if it's, was it about a Victor Green publication? Yeah. Okay. How weird of a world would we exist that you even need a book like that today to tell you that's a sundown town. If you're black, you better leave. You know, it's something we can't imagine today. But again, these this is an ugly world these officers live in. Yes? Did you know there were three institutions in the gas lamp that were listed in the Green Book? I did not. The Douglas Hotel. The Claremont was probably the other, right? It wasn't. I don't, I'm not saying the Claremont wasn't in it, uh -huh. but it's not in the gas lamp or blurring the gas lamp. Okay. So it was the Douglas Hotel, the Sun Cafe, uh -oh. and the Simmons Hotel on 6. Okay, in my book, um, uh, Standing a Murder and Mayhem, I do have a chapter of a murder that occurred over in the Simmons Hotel as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, for those of you, if you go buy the book again, you'll double my sales. But <laughs> I had a I, lot of breakfast in the Sun Cafe. <laughs> I put a uh, lot of the addresses in there so you can grab the book and go walking through town and kind of go on your own little ghost tour. And there's a lot of stuff that 
happen not only down in this area, but as you go further north. Everybody know uh, Tacos El Gordo now is opening in the bottom of the William Penn Hotel. That was the scene of the largest police shootout in American history on April 8, 1965, when a guy walked into the then Hublone Company pawn shop, uh, asked to see a gun, loaded the gun, and then wound up killing the manager of the store and a thousand rounds back and forth between the gunman and the police before he's finally taken into custody. Um, that led to the San Diego Police Department forming the anti-sniper platoon, which later became SWAT. Today we'd handle that completely different. That so, was actually before Los Angeles coined the phrase SWAT. We had it, it was asked, but it was exactly the same operation. So they say we find we did it before you, you know, one of those kills. You can see we're not very welcome at the LA Police Museum, but no, <laughs> <laughs> no all kidding aside, um, the LA Police Museum does a spectacularly good job, and we actually learned a lot from them getting started, and vice versa. Um, Rick and I took a trip up there one time, and they took us into the private archives. Patty Hearst files, the Manson family, Marilyn Monroe, Sirhan Sirhan, Bobby Kennedy, Rick We actually, got, we actually held the gun that, that Patty Hearst was holding in, in the famous picture. Yeah. And then they showed us all the pictures from the uh, Tate LaBianca, oh, the crime scene there and, and all that. And then what's the other, the Onion Field. Yeah, the Onion so, Field as well. So there's a lot of history in police museums. And you know, it's interesting because I, I think we all have a vision in our head as to what the Manson crime scene would look like. And I think your imagination is so built up, you look and go, really? What am I looking at here? And you, you can see it is a murder scene, but it's nowhere as ghastly as I think our imagination lets us to believe. Uh, how, here's a real quick trivia question about the Mansons. How many people in this room can tell me how many people Charles Manson personally killed? None. Yeah, the answer is zero. Yeah, he was in, he was in prison for inciting others to do it. So uh, yeah, kind of interesting. I, I to tell you a story about that. They were going to parole, uh, Patricia Krenwinkel was up for parole. And one of the guys that works in our museum, Tom Giaquinto, was one of the interviewers for the state of California. And she, this woman who wanted to be paroled, she made a, she said, well, they said, well, what was your involvement? And she said, uh, well, I, I chased Abigail Folger into the backyard. And she said, I grabbed her and started stabbing her. And she said, I could see the lights of Los Angeles behind. And she said she fell to the ground and I was on top of her and I stabbed her about 40 times. And she looked up at me and she said, why are you still stabbing me? I'm already dead. And they, I mean, here's a person that wanted to tell that story and was requesting to be paroled back into society. I thought that was pretty interesting. Later matter parole, parole, needless to say. So this next slide here, this is an actual murder case and this is profiled in the book, Murder and Mayhem. But this occurred on April 7, 1920. As you can see, it occurred at 348 J Street. And like I said, unfortunately, that location is not there anymore. But this next part here, four detectives are assigned to the case. That's kind of a big deal because uh, Mr. Waugh, and I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, was a pretty respected businessman in that community. And we said, we need to solve this. We cannot have minority communities being terrorized because they're afraid to contact the police or something. So the chief at the time was James Patrick, but he said, we need to get out in force and show the Chinese community we care about them and we need to do this right. So he assigned four of his best detectives to the case and they ultimately did solve it. These are the killers right here. And these pictures are in the book as well. And it explains that it was robbery was, I don't mean to, for those of you who haven't read this chapter yet, I'll let you uh, find out what the whole motive was. But he was murdered on April 7th. The case was solved on April 20th. By April 23rd, they were sentenced to 90 years in prison. So we did things a lot faster back in those days. And we were actually able to tell them, uh, if you don't plead guilty to this, you're going to hang at San Quentin. And uh, they said, okay, you know, I'll take 90 years as opposed to the rope, because at that point, they would have been hung probably within a few weeks. So, um, but again, this was a statement that the police department wanted to make to the community. We said, we have a high profile case. And quite frankly, in this era, in other parts of the country, this might not have gotten the same attention. It might have been swept under the rug. Well, you know, it's the other side of the tracks. Let's just let them happen. Yeah, and, and we didn't do that, much to our credit. So, and we talked about Keno Wilson, and we got a Keno Wilson reenactor there. Is this the badge you have? Oh, well, I want to see it. Yeah, and then you got the hat like that as well. Okay. And you're not dressed up tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, Keno Wilson did some remarkable things as chief. We talked about the hiring of the minority officers, of female officers, and things like that. And if you notice, he was chief from 1909 to 1917, but he served on the PD for 27 years. Um, he was demoted to patrolman in 1917, so he went from the top 
all the way to the bottom. There's a couple of reasons for that. None of them are really his fault. Well, no, actually he does have himself to blame for this because Kino was doing the right thing at a time where it wasn't real popular to do the right thing. And one of those things was to close down this opium den, gang infested brothel area once and for all. And he realized I'm not gonna do this because the DA has vested interest in this. City councilmen have vested interest in this. I'm not gonna close them down because they're just gonna quit, stop dropping charges on it. And this had to do with the Pan American Exposition coming here as well. It wasn't just one day he had this grand epiphany to do this, and trust me, the city could have made a lot of money if this stuff was still going on. But Kino said, okay, we're gonna have to figure out a different way to do this. So he brought in a health inspector named Walter Bellin to start enforcing state health codes takes it right out of their hands. They have no say in the matter. So now it's at a different level. But one of the things he did too is he appointed two detectives, a detective named Walter Weymouth and another one named Reginald Stewart Townsend. Reggie Townsend was our first black detective in 1915. Again, three years before Jackie Robinson was born, we have a black detective. We actually hired a black officer in 1918 who became our first black sergeant. His name is John Cloud. And he was supervising white officers. White officers wanted to work for him. So we have an interesting photo in our museum and you see officers lined up at a 1921 funeral for an officer who died in the line of duty and in the front of the line is John Cloud, in the front of the line. Now again, nobody blinked twice at a picture like that today. That was remarkable then because think about 30 years later, Rosa Parks is getting on a bus being told in the back and she's, oh no, no, I'm sitting up front, good for her. But we're doing this already and nobody's even blinking. It's being put in pictures, it's in the newspaper. So we're accepting a lot of things that were just kind of off the chart with other parts of the United States. But Kino started his career in 1888 as this, his brother Charlie was the city marshal of Oceanside. He was actually killed in the line of duty, so Kino took over. And Kino had an interesting career because he's a deputy sheriff, U.S. Customs, San Diego PD, ultimately retired as a deputy United States Marshal, and he did 51 years in law enforcement. But one of the things about Kino, Kino is not a sit behind the desk kind of chief. We had an officer who was named Oliver Hopkins, killed in 1915. Kino got out there and personally arrested the guy, he tracked him down and arrested him. In 1910, a crazy uh, fireman went up to Fifth and Spruce, pulled the fire alarm, and then stood there when the fire wagon pulled up. He started sniping the firemen, killed three of them. Uh, he then took off and was on the lam for about a day and a half. Keno Wilson is personally out scouring the city to find him. Her officers ultimately confronted him at Horton Plaza and committed suicide as officers moved in to make the arrest. At that time, that was called the worst day in San Diego history. I wish it still was because we've had some very tragic incidents since then. Um, so Kino was really a cop's cop. He did not drive a car, he rode a horse, and he said, I don't need to learn to ride in a machine. I'll ride in a machine, I don't need to learn how to drive one. So he actually had a chauffeur. It's kind of cool because he had a Cadillac too, a 1913 Cadillac uh, he was driven around in. But uh, Kino actually lived at 14th and Island for a while, and then he also lived up at 3106 Island, at, or K Street. So local guy, um, but a lot of history of Kino. A lot of the stuff he did was revolutionary then, as opposed to now, again, it would be pretty average, but 100 years ago, he was out there. Um, other Keno Wilson stories was he came from Texas, right after the Civil War, in a town that was so wedded to the South that they banned Independence Day in the, in the town. So we're not gonna do it. We don't believe in the stars and stripes. It took a while for, I don't, in some part, anybody here from Texas? Because I think there's parts of Texas still aren't okay with, you know, being a part of the Union. They, I think they're the only state that's in the Union that still reserves the right to secede from the United yeah. States. Yeah, yeah, so there's some fiercely independent people in Texas. So Keno had that, and I think it probably helped him more than it hindered him in being probably our, one of our best police chiefs, if not the best, the best police chief. I know we only had 45 minutes, that was 50. So are there any questions about any of this? I just want to add a couple of things. You guys know about the, uh, the, the under Fifth Avenue here, there was a, a walkway, it's probably sealed off now under the businesses, but there was a walkway that went under all those businesses that was used from everything from running booths to running numbers back in the time. And I'm sure some of them are, just look like basements now underneath. Steve and I were talking about, we're gonna, we'd like to go and, and visit some of those places. Uh, the Diamond Palace uh, pawn shop, that was, that was Wyatt Earp's place. If you look, there's a couple of double doors there with a staircase where he used to go back up into there. Um, I worked in this area, I started in 1969, and I patrolled all around here, and uh, somebody mentioned the Sun Cafe. It was a great place to go there, and what a, what a part of history it was. Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever seen it, but a person built a model of the Sun Cafe. Is that the Center History Center? Yeah, it's, it's absolutely beautiful. but. 
Uh, it was so neat to be part of part of downtown San Diego. When we walked down here tonight, I was showing Steve. We go out on the street right here. There's a building. It used to be an electrical building, and the, the corner of the doors come together like this, and the doors are on the flat portion. One morning, as a young patrol officer, I'm driving down there, and uh, a guy had been stabbed during the night. I found him, and he slid down those glass doors, and the building and the glass doors are still there in the same place. <laughs> so when, once you get in all, involved in this stuff, everything becomes part of history that you are. And uh, San Diego is, is the coolest place and has so much neat history behind it. Um, our museum as well, you guys, I, I hope you'll take the time sometime to come up and check out our museum. We, uh, we're right at 4710 College, like he said, and uh, we always love to have visitors. And, uh, you know, if you want to bring a group up there, if you want to get, get a hold of us or something, we can put together a little tour for you. And uh, I know we've been here a while, so I'm not going to take up much more time. But you see, Steve has he's spent a lot of time researching and doing this stuff. He's on the computer about eight or ten hours a day, I think, and he's putting all this stuff together. And, and we have, uh, I don't know, did you remember, mention the Chinese police officer? No, I was, quite, I was here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, it, it's so amazing that San Diego has probably either done or been involved in most of the programs that police departments are, are forming across the, the state of California. We always would go to a class. We're already doing that stuff. And I don't know why it is, but I guess it's because we've had so many diverse people here over the years that we just, you know, uh, said, do you remember the community relations offices we used to have here? Yes. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I, I have suggested this to people still, and it was a place where the average citizen, if they had a complaint with the law enforcement or a complaint with the community, they could walk in there, they could find a police officer, and they could sit down with them and realize that it's a human being just like everybody else that bleeds and laughs and cries and has a family, and sit down and say, this is my problem, can you help me out with it? We, we, it developed our relationship with the community and it brought the community to us. When I worked here, a lot of the police officers, now they're so afraid to talk to people in the public. If you see a police officer, say hi to them. They're afraid to talk to you. They're afraid to be involved with a lot of this stuff because they're afraid they're going to get in trouble. I used to get out of my car, my partner and I, we'd park our police car down here and we'd walk around. And we maybe we looked dumb sometimes, but we'd walk into businesses and we'd introduce ourselves. And we'd have a cup of coffee with people. And that way people saw that, that we're just like they are and they're just like us. And it actually changed my opinion of how to deal with people. Because I, you know, you get start this young police officer thing and you get this macho feeling like you're really in charge of everything. And somebody told me one time, you know, uh, I, I really don't like the way you are anymore. I mean, you, you really, you know, you, if, if it's not a friend of yours or a police officer, you don't want to be involved with them. So I researched that in my own mind and I went out and I started getting involved with people. People started coming to me and they started saying, hey, you know, this is going on here, this is going on there. If something was happening on the street, they would come to my aid. Now, that's what we need is a, is a cohesive group with the, the police department and the community all together being friends. The thing with the football player, we used to do everything with the Chargers all the time. We would put on big events together. We weren't at each other's odds. And if nobody ever talks about it or nobody ever does about it or confronts what the problem is, it's going to continue. And uh, I don't mean to be getting on my soapbox, but, you know, it, it, we, I love the community. I love all people. And it's, it's really a neat thing to be involved in. And we need to encourage our police officers. So when you see one out there in the street, say, hi, how you doing? Talk to them. They'll be shocked you with all your fingers. But... They will. <laughs> <laughs> and they, really, they will really appreciate it. And I think you'll appreciate getting to know them as well. So thank you guys for having us tonight. Thanks for the great job you did, thank Steve. You. We appreciate it. Yes, We actually played a part in giving them the artifacts, but since then we have not had, we have no say in how it's managed. I know the port, port's pretty receptive to stuff, so there's problems, let them know. Um, you know, but we have no more say in how it's managed than, you know, the average citizen. But, you know, it's interesting because that, I remember one time, Rick and I were actually in the port office, and the president said, what are you going to do with the place? And we said, well, take uh, that center courtyard, restored the way it looked in 1939, cut those windows into doors, have a courtyard where people gravitate in and out, and by the way, tear down Seaport Village. And he looks at like, yeah, yeah, when's your last drug test? <laughs> well, guess what? <laughs> they did that. Yeah. Seaport Village is going under, undergoing a radical transformation as well. So sometimes dream big and it, it actually works.
Okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. There was a, a leading madam in, in the area by the name of Ida Bailey, mm -hmm. and uh, she had the Canary Cottage. It was about a block away, and she was arrested, presumably, in the raid of 1912 that Wilson put on. And I think her business sort of went downhill after that. But there's a record that appears about her life in the local paper. I think it was the 1920s. Um, Sandy, you might know better about this, too. Um, where the police station at 2nd and G would put together a Christmas or holiday box for her to help her get through the year. Oh, no kidding. And I don't know if you've ever seen those records. At all. No, but that, that would be interesting to see. I know that um, the raid you're that? referring to, we did do a sweep and we hauled out a lot of madams and a lot of the girls that work for them. And um, we, we did it, again, in a way that a lot of agencies probably wouldn't have. We said we wanted to look at reforming you. Mm -hmm. So you hear about social justice and stuff like that. We were kind of doing a little bit different back then, but it really had the same mission. Uh, will you reform? Will you leave town? You know, will you turn, uh, you know, a, a new uh, career path? Some did, some didn't. Like anything else, you know, when you deal with human beings, you have a wide range of responses. But I did not know about that. Uh, but it wouldn't surprise me. Um, but yes, yeah, so, I mean, we're learning from the community as well. We go to uh, out and do events and people come, you know, oh, I've been saving this for you for 50 years. Like, well, you stole it because we didn't exist 50 years. Well, thanks for bringing it back. But, um, but we get a lot of good artifacts like that or we'll get people go, hey, you know, my uncle was a policeman and here's this stuff. And all of a sudden we're making some connections there. Um, idea, remember, Joseph Coin Badge, if you find it, uh, we will make you rich. <laughs> Did anybody ever, ever remember the, uh, it was called the Spanish Village at Fifth and Island? Has anybody ever heard about that area? It took up almost a whole block. Uh, it was actually owned by a guy named Blas Sanchez at one time, and it was apparently quite a wild place. I haven't seen much history on it, so if anybody ever hears anything, of it, let me know about it. But uh, apparently there was, a lot, there was a lot of prostitution taking place, a lot of alcohol sales there. And we even, uh, I even understand that up until the 50s, police officers were probably getting presents to stay away from there. So, uh, but if you ever hear about it, let me know. Yeah, it all ebbs and tides. Yes. How many police do they have now? You mentioned some of the earlier. We still have 12. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, but you know, that, that actually illustrates a good point because we went from 25 to 12, so it's always been doing more or less. We actually have about 1,900 right now. Wow. At one time, we had 2,100. Back when the city had 1.1 million people, we now have 1.4 million. So our challenge has been staffing, literally, as you saw, since day one. And um, you know, if anybody wants to become a police officer, we're hiring. No age requirements. Uh, you know, no maximum age. It's a great job. You get to meet all kinds of interesting people. What's that? No mustache. Yeah. No, well, yeah. No, no mustache. You don't have to have a mustache either. But um, you know, and we recruit from the community. But right now is not a popular time to be a cop. So there's that, you know, and it's, like I said, it's always been a challenge to get people. We don't have enough people to go around, so um, we're having to be innovative. We're relying on technology a lot. Uh, we're, I think, population-wise, we have 1.4 million. New York has almost 8 million. New York City has 45,000 cops. They can throw cops, you know, 5,000 cops at a problem. We obviously can't do that. We have to be a lot more creative. We use technology, and we rely on the officers on the street to make decisions. When in other cities you might have you know 50 to 100 people, let's form a committee and figure out what to do with this. Um, it's interesting. We opened because uh, does anybody remember our first museum at 205 G Street when we were over there? Uh, the night we opened, we actually had a guy fly out from the New York City Police Museum to come there. I'll never forget this guy. Uh, he had that real thick New York accent. You know, he goes, "Hey, uh, let me ask you something. How many copies you got here?" I said, and forgive me if I'm not getting this right. I may be talking more like I'm from Boston. But I go, we got uh, 2,000. He goes, yeah, we got 2,000 narcotics detectives. I said, well, you got a narcotics problem. You know? but, <laughs> but it just kind of illustrates, like, wow. You know? So we are a small department for a big city. And that's been our challenge since, like I said, since day one. Yes, sir. A comment and a question. Uh, I was uh, 15 years old up on College Avenue in I got thrown in the back of a police car and taken down to the old police station and written up. Uh, and I didn't do it. I just wanted. <laughs> oh, yeah. What? <laughs> what's that law? What's that line from the Shawshank Redemption? Jails full of innocent people. <laughs> Jack in the box. I didn't do it. It wasn't me. So just for the record. Yeah, well, we get it wrong. We get it wrong a lot. But secondly, to to what you were just talking about, I had a business in, uh, for 37 years. Uh, most of that in downtown. Much of it on Fourth Avenue in the gas line. And the police, boy, the relationship between the business owners and the police in the gas line was fantastic. The, the, uh, we used to have a lot of the bike patrol coming in and hanging out in our place late at night. Uh, and we were a retail store over late. But John Graham 
Oh, yeah. was the officer who created that museum over Yeah, he did, and he was one of our vice presidents at one what time. Is, whatever became of John Graham, he was a great He retired. He retired. He retired. We're all on the board together. We all started the museum over yeah. there together. And he's still in San Diego? Yeah. I think he's, yeah. yeah. You so know what? what? Regards from the travel store. Up there. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Well, um, I ran into him a few uh, months ago down in um, uh, Mission Valley at the shopping mall. Oh, really? And he looks the same. Yeah, oh. looks a little bit more gray hair, but don't we all? <laughs> so, you had a question. They're not. So they're not police. No. The, now, um, if you look at their patch, it's interesting how they're laid out. They do quasi-police work. Some of them have more law enforcement powers than others. Some of them carry guns. Some of them don't. Some of them are co-compliance officers. They can write tickets. They can make arrests, but their powers are very limited in what they can do. Uh, but they're not full police. And you could go into a wonky uh, dissertation about the difference between marshals and sheriffs. There is a difference between a sheriff and a police officer. I don't know how many people know that. Um, but um, there is a difference. There's a reason that they have the different names. So they fit into the enforcement spectrum, but they're not what would be classified as full duty uh, police officers. So how many groups of people do you have in these different organizations? You have police, mm -hmm. you have uh, transit police. Why they have their own police? agency. They work for the Metropolitan Transit System. Okay. Uh, they do uh, call their head of there, who's a former SDPD captain, Manny Guadarrama. They do call him the chief of police. But as defined by the California Penal Code as to what a police officer is, they would not be that. But they do have some enforcement powers. So. Okay. So do you have any more organizations? <laughs> we got sheriffs. Um, you know, sheriff is around the entire county. And funny story, I have a friend of mine that's a sheriff and uh, stopped a guy speeding down the residential street one day. And he goes, you can't write me a ticket. I'm in the city. Yeah, you're in the county. The city's in the county. Do sign here. So, <laughs> so they have jurisdiction. Uh, of course, highway patrol is the state police. Mm -hmm. And for people who are from other states, that's sometimes a little confusing. At one time, we actually had a California State Police. There was not a lot of them. I think it was maybe 200 for the entire state, and they primarily the guarded state buildings. The police, too. They were yeah, actually uniformed, too. The Harbor Police. The Harbor Police, yeah. They're, they're all sworn. Yeah, they are. And Harbor Police has kind of an interesting role because they have jurisdiction in five cities, in Coronado, in Imperial Beach, National City, Chula Vista, and San Diego. But they patrol the state tide Everywhere lanes. Everywhere on the water. Yeah, yeah. The and they're in boats. They have divers. And stuff like that. So yeah, everybody has different jobs and things like that. Um, and then the federal, I've seen the Federal Protective Services, the FPS, you drive the white and blue. You have federal agents, you have Border Patrol, Department of Homeland Security. So a Those lot of you guys, any, do you guys, how many of you live down the gas lamp? Anybody live down there? Mm -hmm. yes. For those of you, you may see us on occasion. We're usually on the corner of Fifth and Market. We come down there with the 1932 paddy wagon. <laughs> the uniform we wear is from that time period, and we let people take pictures with us. You can't say paddy. Pardon? Oh, well, yeah, you know the proper term we have to say for paddy wagon now is the alcoholically challenged Irish immigrant transfer. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, are you going to be in the parade Saturday? We actually, yes, we are. Yeah. Well, I, well we're not, not as I'm going on the fire truck. Yeah, you know what? We, I don't know that we were invited this time. Um, and there's kind of a funny story there. Uh, when Bill Lansdowne was chief of police and we wrote, we used to drive him in all the parades, he still do it with the chief. But Lansdowne made it very clear, do not let the fire department get in front of us. <laughs> so, okay, we always were in front of the fire department. So we're down there one day and we're scheduled to be behind the fire department. So I actually had to go up and you're recording this still? Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm dead, the fire department's gonna kill me. But, um, <laughs> so I went over and had to tell the parade organizer, hey, you know, there's a municipal code ordinance, we have to be in front of the fire department in case something happens. We have to get there first because they wait down the street until we give them the all clear. So the guy goes, okay. So the firemen's getting ready to go, we were right in front of them. And you can tell these firemen like, we're gonna kill these guys. And so the next year, we're standing there getting ready to stage, and we're supposed to go, we see about 40 fire trucks drive by. We're like, uh, I go, Chief, I think they're onto us. He goes, yeah, I think so too. <laughs> so about a month later, my uh, buddy and I are walking, and we run into, uh, he's on our board of directors as well, Ed. Um, we're walking, we run into the fire chief. He goes, oh, hey, how'd you guys like my parade, huh? You guys, you guys are real happy standing there. So anyways. Some good-natured ribbing among first responders, but um, yeah, it's a funny fire department story. Yeah. Why is that black and white car always at the county administration building on the Pacific Coast? Pacific Coast Highway. Pacific Highway. It's probably a sheriff's car because yeah. they do. It's there uh, all weekend long. Oh, is it? Yeah. Maybe no. maybe a phantom car to get people to behave themselves. You know? I think the sheriffs. I think they have people personnel there all weekend. They yeah. Don't yeah, but they're responsible for security in all the county buildings, courthouses, and stuff. You know, that was a major issue. I don't know if you remember or not, but San Diego police cars used to be white. Mm -hmm. And we had 10 officers killed in a short period of time. And one of the major issues that police officers wanted was uh, the navy blue uniforms and black and white police cars. To look more authoritative. To look more official, more like, like police officers. 
Yeah. We were green. We were San Diego PD were green. Yeah. No, from 1915 to 35, we were green. And well, the sheriffs were green and white. Uh, I, all my yeah. time period. I started in '69, and uh, well, they they changed in the '90s to the blues, but I wore the tan most of the time. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't remember, but we had police ambulances. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was almost always assigned to an ambulance, and we every fifth police car about was an ambulance, and mm -hmm. so we were always there. The fire department didn't have any medical services like that. We did it all back. Tell about your first day when you found out about the ambulance. Well, <laughs> I get I responded to a call, and I get there, and it's, this guy's all cut up and everything, and I said I need an ambulance, and so the dispatcher comes back and says, "Aren't you in an ambulance?" <laughs> and I said, "No," and they said, "Well, you're supposed to be." <laughs> so, well, Oops. You better send another one because I'm not. I'm not an ambulance. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> but they were actually station wagons. If you can imagine, you got a, a bad scene. I've had two critical patients, and you got one guy driving, and all I could do was bend over the seat and just try to do what we could do and go as fast as we could to get there. Yeah, driving one hand. <laughs> Any other questions? No, but this was the best, fastest hour in my life. <laughs> good, yeah. That, I, I think that's good, right? <laughs> Thank you. Enjoyed it. One last Thanks. funny story for you. Um, I, when I went to crime prevention school, they give you a big book about different subjects. And uh, one of them was lighting, eight hours of lighting. And I'm going, oh, I hope this guy's funny or something. Eight hours of lighting. And this guy walks out, not kidding. He walks in and goes, good afternoon. My <laughs> name is Lieutenant Roger. Baldwin of the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department, and you can just hear people shooting themselves. <laughs> so, uh, it was the longest eight hours of my life, so thank you. I didn't look up. So thank you very much, everybody. Lecture is on April 10th, The Rise of Lemon Grove in the Second Gold Rush. So we will oh. see you guys then. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I just wanted to do a certain age. Jimmy.